All right. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. I'm extremely excited as per usual, but this time around even more so, uh, mainly because uh, we have a live audience with us for once, which will permit some qu uh, questions at the end if anyone wants to jump in with anything, but also because this is a continuation or part two of our, our initial episode from about a week, week and a half ago, um, which was absolutely just blew me out of the water at least. So without further ado, Dan, how are you, sir? And the floor is yours. <laughs> doing great, doing great. And and you know, it's, it's about Star Trek physics here. And um, let's see here if I pins i bring myself yes so in the star trek physics we started on uh this is intended to be the most clear crystal clear description electrical description of electrogravitics ever and it needs to be to understand warp impulse and the science of star trek physics which is where we started and part one was the intro this is the meat of the conversation here and in terms of you know say it uh, say you're going to say it and then say it and then say you said it uh, the two most important concepts of you know what is impulse power and what is warp propulsion on Star Trek, which is our, our wonderful examples of how to understand electrogravitics. Uh, just to summarize, the reason that impulse power was called that was because in that perfected mercury, iron powder doped mercury vortex, the magnetic and the hydraulic flux inertia down the accurate high velocity vortex cone was stacked in that critical angle. And we'll later see today in today's slide, 76 degree angle, because that's a golden ratio related pyramid implosion angle. So the stack in the array of the implosion angle of Schauberger's imploding piezo water vortex and the Vimana Nazi Bell mercury vortex, which is the same 60 degree vortex stack that is the 60 degree cone here, of dodeca ecosa dodeca star mother kit, which we later proved is a structure of hydrogen. So the hydrogen vortex is stacked in the array accurately implosively with the piezo water or piezo uh, or magnetic mercury vortex. And what that accurate vortex stack enables is the centripetal inertia of both charge magnetically, hydraulically, and electrostatically, that those lines of force are enabled to converge accurately, centripetally, to enable that perfected compression at the core. And what the perfected compression at the core is, and this is the core of what is electrogravitics, is you know that all Electromagnetic inertia is just like all of waves. Some inertia of that wave travels as a transverse electromagnetic inertia, which is the only thing our physics knows how to use for everything, communication, electric power, all. We use the transverse component of that electrical wave. But the more propelling, the, the more compelling, the more coherent component of that electromagnetic inertia is a component of that electromagnetic, remember it's just like a superfluid, which travels as a compressional wave called longitudinal or scalar parallel to the direction of propagation. And remember, that is what Tom Bearden effectively proved by equation is the stuff of gravity waves, that longitudinal component, and is the stuff that causes plants to grow, because that's the only way you can get centripetal is to line up the compressional longitudinal component of that wave in order to implode. Example, that's why the first nuclear device was named implosion, because the phonon component of that explosion on the surface of fat boy, that sphere, had to arrive at center symmetrically to implode, and that was called critical mass. So lining up that compressional component of that wave to implode at core does something called sorting, which reconverts, it's called translation of vorticity, the transverse component down that perfected vortex and emerges at the throat of the, the, the tip of that pine cone as a coherent longitudinal EMF called a gravity wave or longitudinal or scalar. And by spitting that out, that makes not only the, the uh, acceleration of charge directional and begins to define what is a gravity wave, which is simply the acceleration of charge 
due to perfected compression toward center, which literally is implosive. Implosive specifically because the charge accelerates down that cone because of golden ratio conjugate fractality. So that acceleration of charge, when the geometry of compression is perfect, fractal golden ratio, that experience of the acceleration of charge because the cone is perfect is named the gravity. As in when Einstein said, there is no experiment that could differentiate the acceleration you feel in an elevator from the acceleration due to gravity. Meaning gravity is only the name for that experience of charge acceleration. So once you begin to understand the cause of that acceleration to center, then you can answer the question that Einstein died with, why do objects fall to the ground, which actually is this perfected charge collapse. So that's the beginning of our slideshow and where we left off Let yesterday. <laughs> uh, any questions so far, Dave, or how am I doing? <laughs> Fantastic, Dan. Um, I no questions on on my end, at least. <laughs> okay, so uh, kind of a little review of part one, and then we move to part two. So the name of this series is Empowering Physics for Our Star Trek Future, Warp, Impulse, and Stargates Explained, and also Enki's Returning Grail in the Blood. And this should be the most crystal clear description of the wave mechanics of electrogravity ever. That is the intention of this next part of this slideshow. And all this, of course, is reviewed at fractalfield.com slash conjugate gravity. So remember, the reason the vortex down that mercury iron powder was called impulse, and it's still used in many starcraft today. We know from the Pleiadians and others, they're still using mercury vortex. You know, in the old Nazi submarines converted, <laughs> that was a mercury vortex. The reason that vortex made gravity, you need to understand. Otherwise, you're stuck in that museum where they said 10,000 humanoid civilizations in this part of the galaxy, and they only like to come to Earth because it's a Stone Age museum. <laughs> so in order to escape that syndrome, <laughs> Uh, as Randy Kramer said, you need to understand specifically this. And then later, we're going to be talking about warp propulsion, the Kosky frost, what was meant. And that is basically the helical slinky of the z-axis of piezo quartz. And it's pumped by a phase conjugate pump wave. And we will have slides on that. That's what's called warp. And we're going to differentiate that. So that the example is Kosky frost. And there's many slides here about that. And then the example of the med bed, obviously, is the therify.net, a rejuvenation negentropic plasma. And Stargate Portal is an extension of this same physics, where literally where you turned inside out. So remember in part one, we said, if you knew how plasma becomes mindful or implodes, you could know what causes objects fall to the ground and understand everything, like what ghosts do, how tornadoes are steered, how plasma heals. But did you also know that in terms of saving the planet, that learning this lesson of implosive charge collapse negentropy, the cause of gravity and electrogravitic propulsion, is also at the same time precisely the vacuum energy physics principle of all zero-point vacuum free energy devices. Fractalfield.com slash vacuum energy. For example, did you know that any capacitor with a high enough dielectric constant remember it's a measure of charge distribution efficiency, is by definition a zero point free energy implosion device. I mean, this is cool. So for example, zero point free energy devices commonly known on this planet, the infinity salve, Korean, Bearden's Meg, Joe Cell knew him well, hydrolysis implosion, I knew Bearden well too. He uses capacitive implosion pipes and Keshe and many others, their zero point devices, their Achilles heel, is they are unstable. They will quit over the railroad tracks. That steel is the opposite dielectric needed. They will quit at a, so, at a solar, it should, it's not equinox, at a solar um, eclipse. Uh, because when, when the moon gets the way of the longitudinal wave of the sun, that longitudinal array collapses. And that's when your zero point energy devices stop. Literally. And until you understand the physics, you can't use the zero point devices dependably because you don't know why they're quitting. So you have to understand that the longitudinal array loses coherence and then you're toast. <laughs> so you need to know what's feeding that longitudinal array. So until we understand the source of this zero point energy, 
the charged circulation efficient fractal longitudinal array of infinite energy, the only global power distribution without wires option. See why the original pyramid succeeded in making a global wireless power, whereas Tesla failed. He had the wrong implosive frequencies and the wrong implosive longitudinal fractal node geometries. This is what those node geometries were. You've all seen this before. This is the perfect implosion, which we only later proved is the structure of hydrogen. Basically, golden ratio enables recursive constructive wave interference and therefore is the only solution to constructive compression and perfected charge wave collapse, which we will see perfected charge wave collapse is the answer to every question in physics, just about what is consciousness, what is gravity, what is alchemy, what is implosion, what is fusion, what is neg entropy, what is mind? The answer to that question is always perfected wave collapse. In fact, Einstein and all the physics of conscious people agree perfected wave collapse is the answer. They just don't know the cause of wave collapse. That's the problem. And here's the solution. So here I want to credit um, Charlie Zeese and also George Leoniak, uh, who presented beautifully uh, recently at Char Charlie Zeese, uh, StargatePyramids.com. So he presented that this 76.346 degree implosion angle, which is the bottom angle of all the Russian pyramids and the top angle of all the Egyptian pyramids, and the way to get golden ratio, ratio spheres to implode, 76 degree cone, is the angle of perfected spherical optical refraction. We're going to get there when we talk about what John Dee was doing when he used scintillation to communicate with elementals and nature spirits and angels. That's how to scintillate. Because at the compression point of that perfect light cone, you get the communication with the longitudinal array, literally ancestor memory. But more importantly for this conversation, as we see here, Schauberger's vortex, piezo-doped, 76 degree, that is the implosion cone. And later we'll see that implosion in DNA on the far, far right, the same angle is what's named returning the holy grail to DNA, DNA, that implosion. So you've all seen this, this slide before. So when you line up that vortex correctly, whether it's the vortex I proved is the structure of hydrogen or the vortex in Victor Schauberger's imploding water cone, or whether it's a vortex in the mercury, what's happening is the adding multiplying recursively of the charge compression array, both hydraulically, electrostatically, and magnetically, down that perfected light cone is the caduceus, and that's called optimized translation of vorticity. And that's how the transverse inertia here is converted to longitudinal inertia there at the tip of the pine cone. And that's how you make a gravity wave. This is called the L or the perfected translation of vorticity. And this is why it was called the Vril, actually. It's literally a conjugate stargate. So this was the moment when our planet no longer needed to be a Stone Age museum. At this particular moment, the day we published the generalized Klein-Gordon wave equation showing that golden ratio is the definition of beauty in philosophy for even more important reasons in physics. It's the pure wave mechanics of constructive wave interference. It is the most constructive way to interfere waves. Therefore, it is a solution to compression, and therefore it is the solution to every single one of Einstein's unsolved problems and the cause of gravity. So that, I mean, that's the publication. So that leads us then to the conversation uh, we had last time that when we measured John, John Charles Moyen's brain waves, and we did do this last time, that we the moment before he bilocated with witnesses, and we got this golden ratio and octave cascade of frequencies coherently in his brain waves, far more coherently than the kids who were seeing without their eyes. This is at flameinmind.com <clears throat> slash lucid brain. So he was literally turning inside out. He specifically said that just before he bilocated with many witnesses, he saw in one eye where he was and the other eye he saw where he was going. Just the way the kids in class say, 
when they enter trance bliss and they're blindfolded and suddenly they can see without their eyes because they see a vortex tunnel open inside their head, the only definition of the physics of consciousness is that plasma vortex cone becoming focal and centripetal. That's why it's called an eyeball. So this is related to uh, the John D's Newport Tower and the, the uh, ancient uh, pinhole camera physics. It is the turning inside out point literally where you conjugate, therefore implode, and therefore touch the longitudinal array, the collective mind, the stargate physics, it's all that physics. So it's not enough to know that we are afloat or embedded in a sea of consciousness. It is necessary to know what the sea is made of. It's a coherent longitudinal EMF array, dreaming track song line, remember, and the source of all zero point energy and all global wireless power, where specific communication properties is dependent on understanding and using the principles of compression and embedding, which enable that fractal charge distribution array. Literally heaven, planes of throne, shams elive, collective unconscious. It's all a name for that longitudinal array, and we need to understand how it works. So actually, that was a review of last time, I hope. <laughs> uh, and it takes us back to where we left off last, last time. We were talking about the most powerful stargate in our galactic sector, which is the double vortex plasma light cone of Orion. And this is an ancient Japanese woodcut showing the geometry of the Orion stargate. And this is the map of that golden spiral on the Giza plateau, which by the way, uh, Jay Widener was standing over my shoulder helping me when I first did this graphic for Gaia TV when we developed this work with Hancock and Boval and the whole team. And this was called the Antarian Conversion. Uh, and look at the double cone in the, all the ancient mythic descriptions of the Orion Stargate. So the, and the, the, uh, <clears throat> the Templars had lots of language for what this Stargate meant and how it worked. This is a kind of, if you superpose the drawing on the actual light matrix array, uh, the Stargate of Orion. And it is interesting to see that if you take Pleiades Orion Sirius at the right uh, time of year, you see that literally 60 degree implosion cone. The Hopi had a way, a name for this called Pesh May 10, the way of the nine. And this gets into what we're going to talk about later about the return of the nine and the ancestral legend of the nine and the plasma physics from Los Alamos of the nine. It's all about this, the way of the nine, this cone. And so you've seen, this is all at goldenmean.info slash Orion, the heart of the implosion. So when Elena Denon, our good friend says, the most powerful stargate in our galactic sector in the heart of Orion has been infested with the bad guys. Oops, <laughs> we need to know what that means. This is the heart of Orion. It's called trapezium. And it is literally a double vortex plasma cone of incredible density, enabling a stargate that goes further. Because you see, the distance of far stargate propagates is limited by how many golden ratio harmonics faster than the speed of light are cascade imploded at that foci. That's actually the physics of stargates. Now, the fact that this is controlled by the Nabu and Greys doesn't mean that it's evil. It just means that the biggest doorway locally needs to have some parasites kicked out. And we need to understand in order to be involved in that process. This is my work with Larry Hunter, who was the famous, he identified hundreds literally of places on the Giza Plateau, which were a detailed star map of Orion. And he shows at the uh, equinox solstice that it's a perfect vertical right angle pointing to the heart of Orion and what that means, literally the flight of the navigator, and why there are dozens of star maps of Orion all over ancient dolmen sites, including especially Four Corners Midwest. It's all Orion star maps. Compare that to, you say, well, is that the good guys or is that the bad guys? Well, it's both. It's the compression nodes, and therefore it is the only real communication possibility for intergalactic whatever. So the fact that then Hancock in Heaven's Mirror showed that this was a star map of, of uh, Draco at An Anchor Wat. And remember the word Uru as in Uru An means ancient Draco blood and the Uru Anunnaki were. <laughs> so the relationship of the whole story to Alpha Draconis is rich. So this is a review to some of those earlier slides. This is where we actually showed that by simply mathematically modeling wave interference, 
uh, without generalized wave equations, if you simply do the statistics, that golden ratio again shows up to be the solution of maximized constructive wave interference here. And interestingly, octave ratio is maximum destructive wave interference for waves, which is perfect for preventing waves from moving called crystallization. So the hex will fix the spell, the pint will send it. So this is from Nassim's work, and you've seen this before. He did great work. Actually, Elizabeth Rauscher said she did the mathematics for him, where he, he showed if you took the universe radii, the galaxy radii, the solar radii, the atomic radii, and the Big Bang, that all created a cascade based almost exclusively on golden ratio. So Nassim was really on the track with this earlier, and later we showed that this then extended to the radii of hydrogen. So this is that implosion cascade. Most of you have seen these slides and you've seen the animations before. This is kind of review. So this is non-destructive charge compression. This is scale invariance. This is changing scale without changing ratio. And it really sucks. And, and this is the, you know, these are all the old animations. You've seen these. And, and this is the side view versus the top view of that pair of golden spirals, literally the perfect Valentine. And this is the flame that does not consume. And this is called the Sushin spirals. This is, again, those 12 light cone spirals that converge at the dodeca. So this is why Nature magazine says the universe is dodeca, and New Scientist magazine says it's fractal. They're both right, but neither had a clue to why. It's the only way to make, neg make neg entropy and stabilize gravity. That's the point. So actually, they showed that the Arrangement of masses in the universe is specifically dodecahedral. That's what they're saying. So there are many physicists who have agreed with us that fractality causes gravity. Andre Lind, for example, El Nashi, and others. Uh, what they have not said is how fractality causes gravity. And that's what we, we are here to explain. And El Nashi published hundreds of papers on this. We're adding and multiplying go by golden ratio towards center, produces acceleration towards center from compression because in those heterodynes not just of wavelength and but the perfect constructive heterodyne interference of wave phase velocities converts th only that geometry of compression into acceleration the heterodyne and constructive you have phase velocities and that experience of those phase velocities recursively heterodyne and constructively produces compression, I'm sorry, produces acceleration of charge towards center only in that geometry of compression and is in fact named gravity. This is, I think, Dave, when you were chatting with Michael, uh, you had a, a triangular representation of a microwave gravity making device. Yes, that was the patent of um, Dr. Sal Paez that was ah, yes, discussed. Yes, you were talking about yes. Sal Paez. And right. I would like to suggest that now we can understand how that microwave trapezoid, in this case, makes gravity. Because if that microwave cascade is tuned by golden ratio and tuned to Planck, which is how we optimize this, in this case, this is called the EM drive. And nobody's explained how it makes gravity. But what's happening is golden ratio conjugation tuned to the tip of the Planck cone as recursive adding multiplying the phase velocities and the microwave compresses accurately and spits out a longitudinal component at the foci. That's how and why this makes gravity and that's how these microwave electrogravitics could be tuned and optimized using my equation. Non-destructively, correct? Yeah, that, precisely. That, right. that the microwave interference would then be optimized to implosive, non-destructive charge compression, perfected charge collapse, obviously, which is the theme. All, and this is why pine cones make life and make gravity and why a tree rearranges the seeds in a pine cone over the year to adjust how much voltage they're getting from gravity. This is actually the, the, the uh, Lawrence Edward Fields of Form Vortex of Life biodynamic physics. So we know not, now know that Kepler was right when he said the reason the orbital radii of the planets is a platonic nest, because a platonic nest is the way to make golden ratio, and that's how to stabilize gravity. So actually, Kepler's intuition about the platonic nest of orbital radii was fundamentally correct, because Platonic nest, which is also literally how the atomic table is assembled, electron shells and nuclear hadrons are all specifically a platonic nest, which is specifically a way to make golden ratio. And that enables charge collapse. And that is the cause of gravity. 
and those that seven spins of the tetra then defines the perfected slip knot seven spins outside five spins inside which is really a name for the star mother kit dodeca outside and cube tetra seven spin inside and that is the geometry of the anu at the heart of hydrogen seen accurately by the clairvoyance and seen at the heart of the human and seen in the heart of the sun that's the perfect slip knot and that's why the seven layers of heart muscle are exactly the seven spin symmetry axial tilt angles of the symmetry of tetra cube and that's called incubation and that's the physics of the perfect you couldn't get a better squeeze and so this is just again we're reviewing now people have seen this plan so when the nodes of the longitudinal array are locked in this dodecaecosa what that does is they're prevented from moving so then when you bump one here 10 galaxies away <laughs> one billiard ball bounces off that array in perfect charge distribution efficiency that's how stargates work and that's why the frequency signature of the send point and receive point of stargates has to be perfectly frequency matched this is uh, from how a gravity thruster works specifically what the egyptians called the raising of the jed and why the jedi literally when <clears throat> luke skywalker went underground is the plasma projection that enables longitudinal and this is our you know uh jedi school dot science curriculum would you like to raise the jed or which it's the same as raising the vril by the way it's the same as raising the rainbow light body we've got too many names and not enough electrical engineering <laughs> So, and by the way, our Jedi School, which is now FractalU.com, starts again on January 8th. And every Sunday night, we have classes. Uh, they're free. FractalU.com. So, the Vimana was our first example, later called the Nazi Bell, of a how a Mercury vortex made gravity. It's literally the implosion of those phase acceleration velocities. And this became the Nazi, Nazi Bell. It's related to Schauberger's repulsing and uh it was called the glock and so the impulse power was literally the impulse provided actually it's two concentric cylinders rotating at very high speed with that more mercury vortex between them versus the piezo water vortex that used a 50,000 rpm flat spinner impeller below but within the water the the surface of the containment had certain electrical qualities for water it's a um uh, silver or gold for example so we did a bunch of equations on this all at fractalfield.com slash propulsion and acknowledgement to martin jones and elizabeth donovan here to show that if you got the toroidal winding angle accurately you increase the amount of propulsion you get from a water vortex and we measured that actually and this is why um, if you take a spinning gyroscope and you can experience acceleration you can accelerate the spin rate by nutating the spin precession phase angle and that acceleration of the short wave inside the long wave coherently is why planetary radii need that embedding and galactic spin in order to stabilize gravity because this added spin density of the short wave inside the embeddable long wave is the definition of stable gravity so obviously they called this atmosphere maintenance in two-thirds the reason this was atmosphere maintenance they called it planet taming embeddability this this nesting so the earth equator versus the solar equator versus the galactic equator nutate in process and produce conjugate compression at the nodal center this stabilizes gravity and atmosphere and this is the physics of why the pyramid was called the hummer it's literally a phase conjugate pump wave of the infrasound of the Schumann harmonics which piezo pumped the pyramid to implode longitudinal waves and the pyramids are all at dodecaecosa fractal longitudinal nodes and that was a successfully working global wireless power distribution in the ancient pyramid array and the clueless humans today who don't know how those nodes work and got the frequencies wrong keep saying well tesla cheated us because he didn't give us global wireless power well learn the principle tesla had the frequencies wrong and he had the nodes wrong obviously he was not going to succeed and that implosive longitudinal is a dramatic seed growth trigger it is a uh, agricultural fertility device which is why therify.net works 
for that, as did Antoine Priori's plasma. It is a rejuvenation device. It's global wireless power. It's all of those things. So this, this is why the pyramid all, all had to be at the tetrahedral latitudes uh, to get a hold of the spin density of the array. And this is why it was called the gravity diode, a one-way gate for implosion of charge and to stabilize gravity. And they described in detail why they needed to restore atmosphere maintenance. They called it atmosphere maintenance. Hello, does any scientist on this planet know how to rearrange the grid to maintain atmosphere and precipitation and neg entropy? Hello, what is the definition of what we mean by Gaia? Hello, the, the Schumann harmonics are a golden ratio, perfect phase conjugate cascade. So this is all contained in the book Two Thirds. It's a beautiful description of the introduction to gravity engines. And again, this is from Two Thirds. And David Myers, David Percy. So introduction, what they call warp. The warp drive doesn't, bending space-time is a, a, not a helpful language. What actually is bent is the direction of charge propagation because it's sucked toward the center of charge implosion. And that bending of the charge line toward the center of charge implosion called gravity is accelerating charge toward the symmetry center of fractal conjugation Warp, bending space-time is really not the right term for that. And so to understand how a warp drive works, we actually need to understand how we imploded charge. So this brings us to, uh, was Bill Donovan, now it's Elizabeth Donovan's book, Glimpses of Epiphany, which is really a, a whole book about Kosky Frost. That was a crystal that made 800 times its own weight in gravity. It is our best example here of the warp drive. And so in that case, uh, it was uh, a quartz crystal, uh, but lithium niobate is another example. Hence, they were called the, uh, the dilithium crystals in Star Trek. Remember, we're talking about Star Trek physics. In fact, they used a phase conjugate pump wave. The crystal increased in volume by like, I don't know, four to 100 times. And here it's saying 20 times its for former length. And as that crystal increased in dimension dramatically, the dielectric constant went up off the charts, charge distribution efficiency. Then that phase conjugate pump wave could pump. Remember, the model here is the helix of DNA and that quartz crystal in Kosky Frost and the piezolithium niobate. So that helix, that asymmetry of the long axis stairway, now you got this phase conjugate pump wave pumping and that enables implosion, which is directional for exactly the reason that that helix called enantiomorphism is directional. Every single living protein's helical enantiomorphism is one way only in all of biology. That's called up the down staircase. And the reason that helix goes one way only is how the gravity wave became directional out the phase conjugate pump wave up the helix of the warp drive. So this is uh, this is a uh, Scotty in Star Trek saying, we got to blow the warp core. It's damn dilithium crystals. Well, <laughs> what he meant was the dilithium crystals, uh, phase conjugate dielectric was going off the charts, very implosive. And if you got this pump wave and they get out of control. So here is actually what's happening. The enantiomorphic helicity of that helical staircase, that spiral structure, and then you put a phase conjugate pump wave in the sides of the helix. Remember, the definition of piezoelectric is the short wave is the voltage on the sides of the helix, and the long wave is the phonon, the sound, the stricture, the pressure, and the connection between the long wave and short wave, which is enabled by helical piezo, defining DNA and quartz, is the stairway to heaven. That's how you get short waves to talk long waves if you'd like to make the phone call to God. So that, that helical and antiomorphism of the piezo crystal is a clue to this warp core, the warp propulsion physics. Now, it should be noted that, um, and we're going to get to this here when we talk about uh, when Dave was chatting with Michael Sala a few days ago, it, it, you know, he was talking about this implosion in DNA. It was useful. And Dave made a very interesting speculation. He says, well, maybe the extra axis of spin, the extra uh, 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 spiral helical stairway, the next dimension in DNA, maybe it's gold. <laughs> Is that what you, I remember 
<laughs> that was dangerous. It was very interesting. And it's almost useful because actually tests have shown that a thread of DNA or a thread of uh, monatomic carbon, actually, fullerenes, or a thread of gold, gold a nanofilament, any one of those, if you zap them with amperage at the moment of crystallation, becomes a measurable superconductor. Visualize the movie Powder or visualize Daniel Brinkley after his lightning near-death experiences. Everybody he touched, he could, he could see every key emotion of their life specifically because his DNA had become a superconductor due to that lightning. Remember, Tesla's greatest bliss experience was just after almost dying <laughs> due to electrocution. <laughs> that was a compression wave imploding a quasi-superconductive state on his DNA. So if you survive the lightning, you know, if it don't kill you, <laughs> and this is introduction to Kundalini 101, of course, the, the physics of bliss, the movie powder. Uh, so this sets up a waveguide geometry, which originally they said the reason the DNA braid recursion or the DNA, uh, a carbon nanofilament, so carbon nanofilaments do the same thing. And they speculated, well, the reason a carbon nanofilament becomes a superconductor is because its diameter becomes a low integral multiple of the wavelength of the electron itself as a waveguide, which is useful, but... Actually, what's happening is the charge collapse path to the center of that helix, that slinky, the charge collapse path is actually bouncing in and out to the central nodal array of that visualized fullerene, which is dodecicosa star mother, and the perfected charge collapse path to center which is named the jitterbug. And even, even Nassim got this right, although Tom Sawyer talked years ago about this, that perfected charge collapse modeled by this jitterbug. You got uh, Cubacta Ecosa. Can I, can I just say, Dan, very quickly, I believe back uh, prior to World War II in Germany, they called this the Zitterbuegung. If oh, I'm not good, good, good. Yeah, yeah. The, say that again, Zitter. The, the Zitter Buagunk, I believe appro appro approximately it translates to constantly oscillating or vibrating. It never stops. Oh, uh, yeah. The perfected, the perfected jitterbug. See, the reason it's called a jitterbug is because you can jitterbug between the uh, cubocta, ecosa, and octa. But at the actually, that jitterbug collapse will then go to tetra. I learned that personally from Bucky. So the, the reason why this is perfected charge collapse is the traverse path of the nodes approximates a golden ratio spiral. That's why that's a model of perfect charge collapse. So, so the nodes inside the slinky tube of the DNA helix or the gold monofilament thread or the carbon nano thread, the nodes actually approximate bouncing in and out to the center of dodeca ecosa, a phase conjugate nodal thread. And that means that longitudinal nodal array down the center of the zipper is the reason it's a superconductor. Now that's very important later when we get to look at how stargates work. They're literally these tubes and they nest embed because. So if you ask a conventional physicist, they'll say, well, uh, we get action at a distance because of entanglement, and this creates an Einstein-Rosenbridge wormhole. Well, that's correct enough, but it ain't accurate or complete. Actually, what they're calling entanglement is perfected embedding, and embedding entanglement perfected is defined by golden ratio phase conjugation, which defines the way to couple with a longitudinal nodal array, which defines the way into a stargate wormhole vortex nodal charge distribution. So, you know, when Jodie Foster gets into her dodecahedron to have the lu lucid dream called the movie Contact, she's actually embedding in a longitudinal array. And today we make longitudinal arrays with therify.net and we regularly trigger lucid dreaming, which accurately predicts who's going to take memory through death, embedding it coherently into the longitudinal array. So... <clears throat> In fact, golden ratio phase conjugate perfect nesting is the perfection of entanglement and the resulting coherent longitudinal EMF plasma projection includes golden ratio superluminal cascades action at a distance down the vortex. It's always longitudinal. And the number of golden ratio harmonics embedding is the number, number of golden ratio harmonics faster than the speed of light defines the number of dimensions 
because it defines the number of axis spins superposed, which always have to be superposed by golden ratio or they're destructive. So that's why it's called density or the next dimension. It's literally the compression into that array. So time space is not warped. This, this is the fractal attractor. Time space is not warped. The charge paths are connected faster than light. Remember Professor Raymond Chow's measurement of phase velocities faster than light was golden ratio times C between 1.5 and 1.7 times C. All the measurements. That's a smoking gun. So the charge paths are connected faster than light due to conjugate implosion. That fractal phase conjugate implosion also means meaningfully describes the cause of gravity. Describing space-time as somehow bent is not helpful. It is the lines of charge compression which implode and thus fractally attract, causing the acceleration of charge towards symmetry center named the gravity. The seeming action at a distance of black holes, stargates, and portals is a result of golden ratio fractal multiples of the speed of light, reference Professor Raymond Chow, nested perfectly due to conjugate conjugation, create coherent longitudinal EMF interferometry. That's the array. That's the that's heaven. That's planes of Sharon. And Bearden proved that's the stuff of gravity waves. So actually, that wormhole is the compression into the longitudinal array. And that's the physics of action at a distance. So the, the plenum infinite energy, these are from the vacuum energy presentation I made at Amsterdam, fractalfield.com slash vacuum energy. So you've seen, seen these slides before, space time is not ventilated. And remember, time only names relative rate of spin, only. So time Can I also not... throw in very yeah. quickly, uh, Dan, I just wanted to add very quickly that understand it's been proven um, both in theoretical physics and I would say in 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 a more sensitive sense experimentally that understanding just the tip of that wormhole is the is all that needs to be understood because then the rest propagates from the exactly that, right. it's the perfect compression point to touch the longitudinal array and when you impedance match that longitudinal array accurately that's how you set up the stargate and the re, the, the portal and the bilocation is the impedance points coupling to the stillness of the nodal array of the longitudinal interferometry and that's why it's very important not to be confused by they, they saying space time is bent that's crap actually Time speeds up when you accelerate because accelerate translates some of the vorticity of charge acceleration into increased spin rate at center. And that's named time. It ain't complicated. They're, 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 they're proportional. They move well, together. Well, in other words, time is a name for how fast something is spinning. And of course, if you increase the spin rate, then it increases the aging. So once you understand that time is not bent, acceleration of time by acceleration by mechanical acceleration happens because some of the iner charge inertia of the mechanical acceleration translates in vorticity to spin density at the atomic level, hence the acceleration of the experience of time. So this is review of the universal physics. The vacuum is simply a charge superfluid whose distribution efficiently depends on fractal conjugation. So it all behaves as a superfluid. And Nassim, and we all agree on that, the universal Ether is simply the compressibility of charge as a superfluid and plus and minus charge are a name for compression and rarefaction and nothing else. An implosive compression solves all the problems of physics when you understand why anything is centripetal. <laughs> then you can understand why objects fall to the ground and then everything else, stargates. So this is the perfect flame. It's the fire does not consume. It's perfect implosive compression, phase conjugate dielectric, perfect fusion. And it is a solution, you know, Fusion energy will be solved when longitudinal interferometry for microwave solves the problem of plasma containment. So the dummies that don't know how to compress longitudinal inertia at a distance with microwave coherence obviously can't solve the problem of heat containment because they don't understand anything about action at a distance. Okay, so we carry on. And this is the fertility of fractal space-time. So these are the old slides. Fractality perfected is recursion perfected, is embedding perfected, is self-similarity, is compression, is implosion, is entanglement. You, you get the idea. We got too many names for the same thing. But once we understand electrically, so Tesla's mistakes were that he didn't get the frequency cascade right. Choosing 60 hertz was a dramatic... We're not insulting the poor guy. He was a genius, obviously. But the core physics of how to couple longitudinal array, for example, his scalar beam weapons, understood required a more accurate 
understanding of longitudinal interferometry. He did not have. He planted his light bulbs in the lawn to try to light them at a distance, and they were not at longitudinal nodes. And he used a frequency cascade, which didn't fit my equation, so he couldn't conjugate to longitudinal accurately. So I'm not picking on the poor guy, but I'm saying you need to understand power at a distance or you won't understand heaven. I mean, <laughs> so this now we're getting to the Enki story of returning the grail in the blood. So Enki gets here and he names his genetic experiment Adam, as in Adam and Eve, meaning the red man. And he had never foreseen iron-based blood. <laughs> now look at the difference between chlorophyll and uh, hemoglobin, ain't it interesting? You unplug the magnesium and you plug into iron. <laughs> the myth was, you know, well, when the humans were forced underground for millennium after the great uh, Lemurian Atlantean war, which is, by the way, when the Galactic Federation tried to bomb the Nebu out of here, that's really how it happened. And that's the lesser dryad. And that's the solution to all of Hancock's problems. The lesser dryad, the big flood, was the Galactic Federation arriving here to bomb out the Nabu. And once you understand the origin of the flood and who arrived, Viracoca, Quetzalcoatl, all names for Enki, Hermes. So <laughs> suddenly all that history becomes crystal clear. And it's about Enki coming back saying, I'm going to do the Adamic race, <laughs> the human experiment. And so this is why our blood is red. And remember, Jean Charles bleeded green blood, <laughs> as did Enki. You know, he looked like a frog at that time. <laughs> and so, this is an interesting introduction to our Enki comes back with the solution to the Grail in the blood, which we're going to get to. So, the reason it was called the Mana Machine actually was because it actually means a transportable one with the tanks. And it's actually their spinning monoatomics, if you ever were there with Keshi, when the spinning ping pong balls lifted his car, made gravity. Of course, he couldn't make his nano stuff pure enough because he don't get the physics. But if you can make the nano pure enough, and our nano team obviously believes they can have solved this problem. Now, so rotating conjugators make gravity. That is core physics here. For example, fullerenes. So when we asked Paul about the shaggy algae, which makes gold powder into edible bread named showbread, the mana ormis, the spice. Actually, the reason that a arc square wave stabilizes gold in its monoatomic state sufficiently to become edible which is the physics of Ark of the Covenant. So the same implosive capacitance, remember gold and high dielectric acacia wood was implosive capacitance, which is the original Syrian design for the Ark of the Covenant, which was designed at that time primarily to non-destructively contained radioactive materials. Because the Anunnaki could not get through the Van Allen belt without nuking themselves through. They were klutzes, let's say that one. <laughs> and uh, so they had to have a container for their nukes and they bought this from the Syrians. This is a long story. So. Uh, and they later called that the plague of azoth, plague of nitrogen, because the Draco were nitrogen breathers. But the plague of azoth actually in the Bible meant radiation poisoning. And so this container for radioactives is proven by, I was there when Keshe got the phone call from TEPCO in Japan saying, by golly, these nano layers reduce radioactivity. Ain't it cool? <laughs> so this was called showbread, the mana from heaven. Now, the other little piece here, the this is called the somatid cycle. Remember, our theme is Star Trek physics. And in Star Trek physics, we now we're going to mix our metaphors from Star Trek to Star Wars here. I'm warning you. <laughs> but in Star Wars, this was called microchloridians in the blood. They would measure to see if you are a Jedi. <laughs> now, at, at Montauk, and I knew some of these guys personally, they called this Boson 7 measurements in the DNA. Is your DNA imploding? Then you can steer the time chair. You can be the time empath. Well, what were they measuring? I point to you to the physics of what's called somatids and microzymes, coherent conjugated, conjugating plasmids in the blood, which indicate the presence of charge implosion. And this is from the original somatid cycle from the Galileo the microscope gas Galileo the microscope Gaston Naissance. And it was Chris Bird writing with him that originally we hung out a lot. Originally, 
sent me all the books on Antoine Priory, which later became Therify.net, thanks to Chris Bird's interest in Antoine Priory and translating the Gaston Nesson's Galileo the Microscope. Now, our friend now measuring the blood effect of plasma, Therify.net and Quantify, determined, for example, after the, uh, I will call it the medical stabbing, <laughs> the disappearance of these plasmids. Oh my God, where did your soul go? Okay. <laughs> So you get the flavor here that we need to understand the life of this living plasma. Yeah, so this, this is actually, I think we have we have films of this. Oh, I thought, oh, well, there's a film of this, it, uh, the live blood cell. So this is on the left before and on the right after exposure to implosive conjugate plasma. Therify.net, quantify, and also plasmafire.com. This has been measured for all of them, actually, that you get this dramatic declumping called derouleau. The cell is able to stand by itself in implosive plasma. And the disappearance of these microzymes or somatids after things like disease or medical stabbing <laughs> um, is measurable. And this coherence plasma is directly related to our Star Trek physics. Oh, yeah. So I think we had some of these uh, actual films here oh yeah so yeah, good we got we so these are some of the actual live blood cell films and we must thank our what i think is a world-leading biodynamic scientist laurent who's been doing these measurements consistently and by the way patrick now our programmer for uh flame and and for plasmafire.com is also using the same tool the live blood cell microscopy to measure this somatid presence so what's meant by this? Remember when um, the uh, microtubule physics of consciousness, this is um, uh, Gary Schwartz, and um, I'll remember his name in a minute. They're saying the microtubule is the waveguide physics of consciousness. And this is useful, but incomplete. Clearly, the seven nine, here is a, a nine sides of the basal body of the microtubule, which is microwave coherent, uh, is part of the physics of consciousness because it's part of how the cell phase conjugates. This is related to the microchloridians in the blood, boson seven, this whole story. But when it is aligned in a double cone, and that's the point. So here, remember, this is in the context of the conversation of what is the grail in the blood, implosion in cell metabolism. Here is a picture of the metaphase of meiosis, mitosis, particularly mitosis. And notice that picture is essentially a double cone and in effect a tetracube, literally a phase conjugate double cone. And here, what's the line in the double cone? It is the microtubule. So there I was in biophysics class at the University of Detroit saying, oh, well, what's holding these billions of subcellular molecules together during mitosis? It's a gorgeous dance, but what's holding the whole damn thing together? It must be something centripetal. Hello? What is that field? It is a negentropic phase conjugate charge implosion, literally a double cone focused on this cross point at the center of the double cone, which is the phase conjugate centripetal moment, choreographing the rebraid embedding of DNA around the microtubule alignments of that cone. So that double cone, double vortex of phase conjugation perfected is the grail in the blood. Now, speaking of that octahedron, Here's our friend, actually, I spent a lot of time with uh, Preston Nichols, who became the centerpiece of the uh, Montauk Philadelphia stories. And also I knew Al Bielek very well. And here's Preston there with his, what he called the Deca Delta antenna, which you see is an octahedron for phase conjugation. And this is how they actually steered the time chair at Montauk. Okay, this is the implosion in the blood. And they literally measured the boson seven in your DNA before they decided which teenager could steer the time chair and the reason he was named a time empath is very important so this is the grail secret this implosion by phase conjugation in the blood enabled by this coherent phonon implosion therify.net is just one example 
So this relates to the Templar Grail agenda and <clears throat> this perfected embedding. And you see the Grail mystery here. This is Ren Le Chateau. You see the Holy Grail. And this is a Templar called Repair of the Fabric of Time across Europe. For example, where the Michael line here from Britain crosses St. Michael's Island accurately on the map leads you to the cave only accessible from the sea with smooth stone walls where the Templars found the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, that Ark of the Covenant would only function well, for example, to implode and contain radioactives and be a weapon, if it's on the magnetic line. Hello! So, to you know, the Ark of the Covenant is not unlike the Therify. If you put it on a magnetic line, it works better. True for any cathedral or pyramid or lucid dreamer or, or cozy rev telepathy. So that's what those lines mean. So this is then the background. Choosing compassion carefully aligns the magnetic field donuts around the heart so that that nest So when Enki said he's bringing back the grail in the blood, what did he mean? This is the, the sort of climax thought of this series. What is that grail in the blood? It's a cup within a cup. Which has no inside or outside solves the problem of separate. It's really cool when, when uh, our wonderful neighbor, who's a mystic here, the lady, feminine reproductive organs, into that three D fractal, you can zoom in forever and always see the same thing, heart within heart, perfectly self, the grail, self embedded compassion. <laughs> well, so she, she went in the therapy and she came out. She'd never heard anything of our lectures on the origin of the grail, and she came out and she said. I saw this bell within a bell, a cup within a cup, and she was in plasma, and she drew pictures, and our Therify blog shows her seeing the grail inside Therify plasma. Wow. <laughs> she tells the whole story about that. And so this is why the actual, this is the physics of the swastika, which is as old as India. It's actually about the physics of charge implosion, obviously. So yeah, this is a, Marie Claire is her name. And she, she says, I saw a golden cup inside the plasma. I had my eyes closed. <laughs> and uh, it, so, you know, not only can we help trigger lucid dreaming, but we can help trigger the grail in the blood. This is implosive turning inside out. And, and like I say, some of these slides are the old slides and some of these slides are the new slides. So how this implosion happens in DNA is obviously the key part of our theme for this conversation. You've got Golden ratio hydrogen at the center of the zipper, the physics of soul in the, each codon of DNA. And down that helical zipper, down the thread of that vortex, which is measurably recursively braid within a braid, braided. This is measuring the braid density in DNA responding specifically to the coherent phonons of the heart at the moment of love. You can measure the density of the recursion in that braid within a braid directly when you have heart coherence, which is the recurrent low frequency infrasound, which triggers that braiding process, the emotional biophysics of bliss. So that is an example of grail in the blood, obviously, which is a wave within a wave or embedding perfected. So the phonon braid discipline during bliss induced DNA implosion is regulated by the spacing. Now remember, Anki says, I'm bringing back the grail into blood. The spacing is controlled by what they thought was junk DNA, the non-coding, but <laughs> it ain't junk. <laughs> it's what aligns the active sites. And so when the recursive braiding implodes, it creates longitudinal coherent plasma projection, the rainbow light body, the Kesjan body, the Vril, the soul. It's why there are rainbows when Tibetan saints die. Okay. This is the grail in the blood. So emotions, phonon, braid induced codon alignment controls active sites. What DNA replicates by what gets access to the RNA by what's folded inside versus what's folded outside. And that's how emotions program DNA literally. And it's how implosion happens in DNA and what determines who gets to lucid dream and then to survive death. That longitudinal plasma projection, heaven, coherence, the Kesjan body. So in Grammatical Man, entropy, Information, Entropy, Language, and Life, Jeremy Camp Campbell famously showed that the context richness, literally embeddability, hint perfect nesting, in DNA means it was self-correcting. 
If there's enough context in the book and you lose three words, you can put them back in. <laughs> That's called context richness, which is embeddability. And embeddability perfected is, <laughs> nesting perfected is, entanglement perfected is, <laughs> phase conjugation, obviously. That's why, now this is from my friend Ann Ting, Geometric Extensions of Consciousness, originally published in Zodiac Magazine. So it shows the angle of spin and the diameter of spin and the radius of spin are all golden ratio in DNA. And that goes from tetralattice, lattice, cobweb, tunnel, spiral in the DNA braid recursion, which is later literally a map to the Heinrich Clouvet form constants, which all the lucid dreamers saw at the moment of death. So the reason you see lattice, cobweb, tunnel, spiral at the moment of death, the Heinrich Clouvet form constants is literally your DNA has to braid, implode coherently, successfully to enable you to enter heaven. I mean compression. I mean the little black hole, which is successful death. So we saw that slide before, and we've been through this about braid embedding. <clears throat> and this is another slide about braid coherence. So I think, uh, oh yeah, this is a good animation of recursive braiding in DNA. Maybe we just play this. So the braid within the braid and <laughs> braiding. So when Dave said, you know, the next thread in the DNA is might be gold. No, the next thread is the coherence of the next superposed braid. That's what the next thread is. And so when your DNA is braided recursively, more and more implosively, the plot thickens. I mean, the DNA thickens. I mean, the embeddable. So thread into string, into rope, into fat rope, into DNA actually becomes toroidal. And that's sort of the... This is all in our DNA manifesto article, and we're not going to do all those slides right now. And this, yeah, so this is this is the thread, this is the string, this is the rope, this is a braid in a braid of a braid braiding. And when that recursive braiding becomes embeddable, then you have that boson seven, microcoridians in the blood, et cetera. So that, I'm going to stop this section now. There's a there's a follow-up section. We have too much here. Would you um, prefer Dan to save it for maybe part three, perhaps? <laughs> well, we could. Let me, let me stop the screen share. Okay. So in terms of uh, recapitulation here, do you now know what impulse power propulsion is? Do you now know what warp propulsion is? Do you now know what a Stargate portal is? That's introduction to, once you understand why an object falls to the ground, then you can understand everything else. That's the summary of this physics. And you're right. The, the next section was about, is more about the Enki story. And I think you're right. Maybe that should be part three. But do we have any questions or comments? Let's let's play. Yes, actually, I was going to say, I'm going to stop the recording on my side before we get to the questions, just to um, uh, simplify and also for the sake of, uh, to respect the privacy of, of the members here, because I didn't ask beforehand if they wanted their questions to be recorded or not. So for everyone that's watching on, on the recording, thank you so much. For those that join in live, of course, you can do a bit of a question and answer with, with uh, Dan and uh, myself at the end, and we'll catch you all next time. Thank you so much. Yes. And maybe if you have if you have a question here and you think it's shareable, go ahead now. So no, it's OK. Go ahead. Perfect. All right. Does anyone have any questions for uh, for Dan? Uh, you can type it in the chat. You don't have to speak it if you if you don't want to. Um, it, beautiful presentation, by the way, Dan. Very, very well done. And it's yeah. That's unavoidable it. that it was fast but it was compressed <laughs> right <laughs> right, but, right. But you see if you want to understand these things it's really necessary to see how they all fit together right exactly it, it, it's it's to, to your point it speaks to even what we had built upon from the first from your first presentation which was that understanding one component of it literally un, uh, allows you to understand the rest and then take different perspectives of those different areas and then from there people can perhaps um it, take away different uh i guess you could say views of the same thing but it, it's beautiful um it, heather says excellent presentation thank you um if you absolutely. understand why anything is centripetal then you can understand everything <laughs> isn't it it's that simple <laughs> i like, couldn't agree more i couldn't agree more like um, an electron right right exactly um it's actually funny funny you say that because I was, uh, let's see here. Mr. Wolf says, amazing presentation, exactly what I needed to help enhance my understanding of how to apply my Therify. Thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you. So, so you see, when when people uh, with Elena Danan and Michael Sala uh, are describing an intro to the physics here, um, it's actually possible to discuss this with electrical engineers and not lose the average layperson who's willing to think about a little bit of science. So don't be afraid of these terms like what is Planck? It's the universal musical key signature of the universe. What is phase conjugation? What is implosion? What is a longitudinal wave? Very basic, simple understanding of these things. And suddenly you can understand that array. And that's the key to everything. Like after you have a few bliss experiences, why is it that you can feel ley lines so well? <laughs> right. Uh, Dan, Kyle would like to know, is the slide deck available anywhere for further review? I, I take it he mean, yeah. Yes, uh, these, these slide shows uh, we will put at fractalfield.com slash conjugate gravity. So this will be up there in a few days. Thank you. The PowerPoint okay. converts to HTML. It's a key. Awesome. Uh, Kyle says, thank you so much. Um, all right, so it seems like that's about it. I think, uh, truth be told, Dan, I think that it's not that there's a lack of questions. I think it's more so uh, taking the time to absorb the uh, the enormity of 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 breadth, uh, depth and breadth of how beautiful your presentation was and how you explained it so eloquently without having to go through a you know a three four year university class that doesn't exactly and you know answer much in a lot of regards to begin with arguably so <laughs> yeah people should be empowered to understand these things for themselves and they will understand lucid dreaming <laughs> and they will they will understand what happens at the moment of death electrically they'll ha understand what happens in a stargate in a portal so it is important to think about things th these things directly in an empowering way so yes thank you very much i say blessings to everyone i'm going to turn off record here now thank you perfect